terms of um, the next presentation, uh, this truly signifies that I think CII has become a global organization. Uh, this next team has flown in from Norway. They actually got here um, on Sunday, kind of in the middle of the night. So they've had a long week. If you guys think uh, you've had a long week, they've come a long way and had a long week. They're going to be talking to us about successful uncertainty management in a mega project. So that's their topic. They're going to be sharing some experiences of what they've done overseas. And let me give a brief introduction of the uh, participants in, in the team. Uh, first of all, there's Sinova Sandberg. She's had a long career in both the public and private sectors. Uh, she's uh, been uh, the director of project development and construction uh, since 2014 in that industry. Uh, she has uh, urban planning departments in two munis municipalities uh, and has a, an extensive career in that, uh, in that field. She uh, also uh, holds a MSc in engineering from the Norwegian Institute of Technology. Joining her is Yvonne Berka. She's a quality and risk manager and has been responsible for quality and uncertainty management uh, for this particular project since 2013. So she's been working on it for close to five years. And then finally joining them is Dr. Agnar Johannesson. He's a consultant, researcher, and lecturer that's been assisting them in this project. So I'd like to welcome that team to the stage. Welcome. Thank you. This painting, The Scream, is a Norwegian national icon. It's uh, the fifth most valuable painting in the world. And the scream will be on display in the new National Museum in a separate room dedicated to the Edvard Munch collection. So what does this painting express? Is it fear, surprise, unrest, sadness? For sure, it expresses some sense of uncertainty. And as the director responsible for the commissioning and the construction of the new National uh, Museum in Oslo, with the project manager reporting to me, I sometimes share some of the feelings, although not so strongly. Stotsvig has worked systematically over several years on risk and uncertainty management, also inspired by the CII. We have de developed methodology that we apply on all projects in our portfolio and we have a strong record, track record on handling risk. And our presentation will focus on how we in the construction phase of the new National Museum have assessed and managed the upside risk, the opportunities. The new National Museum for Art and Design will be the biggest museum in the Nordics. And two years ago, uh, the project had cost expectations over budget and was lagging behind on the time schedule. Today, the project is forecasting to be delivered on cost, time, and on quality. And we have managed to turn the downward trend by carefully directing our uncertainty management towards hunting for the opportunities, and it pays off. We have revealed 160 opportunities at a total value of 65 million US dollars. Statsbygg is the Norwegian government's key advisor on construction and property affairs. We are the government's building commissioner and project and property manager. And Stotsbyg is a public sector company responsible to the Ministry of Local Government and Modernization. And some key numbers 
of our uh, business can be seen on the slide. Our project portfolio includes justice buildings like prisons, police houses, courthouses, university and colleges, traffic and border stations, museums, the new, the, the National Theatre, the Opera House, if every, any of you have been in Oslo, I'm sure you have seen the beautiful Opera House, and also the Royal Castle, to mention some. The new National Museum of Arc, Arc, Art, Architecture and Desi Design is located in the central downtown Oslo. And the site is surrounded by traffic, pedestrians, and there is a major boat traffic point nearby. The Nobel Peace uh, Center is just in front of the new building. And one of the two main railway stations in Oslo used to be located on the site. One of Oslo's uh, bypass tunnels runs underneath the construction site, as do uh, the main sewage pipe for Oslo. And as you perhaps can see on this illustration, the building consists of two main elements. It's the base building in concrete, which has a facade of slate stone. It's very beautiful. And the transparent uh, glass exhibition hall on top. The spectacular particular signature element of, that build, of the building will be an illuminated box landmark at dark. And of course, a project like this has some challenges. The glass hall. The aesthetics and the technical quality of the outer glass layer in that hall has been a real challenge. The hall is altogether 130 meters long, and it's, as I said, on top of the top stone building. And then there is this slow, uh, the slate stone facade. It's a big puzzle. Uh, it's Norwegian stone. It has been shipped to Germany and processed there, and then shipped back again. And then, there is, of course, a construction pit that also goes below sea level, and we also make use of sea water to cool down and heat the building. <coughs> this building is the most prestigious building under construction in Norway today. And so then, of course, the quality of the materials and the completion, like the finishing of it all, is very crucial for the final uh, result. And I can assure you, we have a very, very ambitious architect. Also, we have had, of course, some challenges regarding the process. We have, not to make it easy for ourselves, separated the architect and the engineering team in two separate contracts. Altogether, we have 27 construction contracts, building and technical contracts. And we have experienced margin fade, both when it comes to the monies and when it comes to the time. And we have also made some changes in the project organization. We changed the project director and we reorganized the project when we were going into the execution phase. It's, not, it's a common thing to do, but it kind of takes a lot of attention and you have to do it very carefully in order not to, to lose speed. So with this context, one major approach was to enforce the uncertainty management in the project or included in that was a hunt for uh, opportunities. And Agnar, he will now explain to you the reasoning behind the focus on the opportunities from a research pain point of view. And then Yvonne, she will later take you through how the project has conducted the opportunity management.
Thank you, Sunava. Um, yes, uh, starting a little with the, the background on risk management. CII has, of course, has risk management as focus for many, many years since they started back in 1983. And, and numerous of investigation has showed the value of focus on uncertainty and risk management. The last report for a couple of years ago said 25 cost saving and 39% schedule saving is, is some of the effects of this, this work. So CII have been in the front developing the tools, guidelines, practical advice, and how to implement risk management for more than 30 years. So why do we need one more presentation on this topic? I will start answering this in a minute. Um, to go a little bit in the background for uh, where we had in this project, in 2014, a new large research project was started in Norway. It was called the Speed Up Project. And the focus in this project is how to make the planning and execution 30 to 50% faster without jeopardizing the workforce and without adding any extra cost, avoiding the crash cost to make this happen. We need to start chasing opportunities in our projects. One of the means we used uh, to demonstrate this is possible is using demonstration projects that we can learn from. So we looked for a project that had a clear goal to produce uh, fast. And for some years ago, we made a plot uh, over more than 100 projects in Stadsbygd's uh, portfolio. And we discovered that the new National Museum was way up in the right corner of this plot. Uh, and they have to, to, to average, uh, spend uh, eight times more per month than the other projects in the portfolio. So we asked them if they could be a demonstration project for us in SpeedUp so we can go and learn for how they manage this. So in October 2016, we were invited in and we did an uncertainty analysis focus on time in this project. And the result from that process revealed that the new National Museum could have a possible time overrun, just like Sina mentioned, in six to eight months. If they didn't change the building strategy and, they did, and the, indeed they needed to start chasing the opportunities to avoid being late with delivery. So, as I said, risk management has been the, around there for many, many years. In Norway, we generally talk more about uncertainty management in our process. Uh, and um, I will try to explain why. So, in Norway, in, in the 70s, uh, uh, risk and uncertainty management kind of divided in two schools. We talked about the risk school and the uncertainty school. The risk schools kind of said that risk is something bad, some unwanted, something we, do, we should avoid. And the focus was to minimize the risk. Positive risk and opportunities have no place in that school, in my opinion. The other school, the uncertainty school that I'm more a kind of a person in, is considered uncertainty as a more neutral concept that consists of risk and opportunities and believe that projects need to have a broader view and harvest both sides. So in this school, uncertainty means that something could go faster, something could go better. Things can cost less than planned, but we have to do something to get this happen. We need to improve our project during the process. Or things could go wrong, things can take cost more, sometimes go worse than planned. There are also, of course, risks involved, and both needs, side needs to be managed. So we have this kind of view that it's an upside and a downside, and both things need to be in the, our tools, and the tools are there, available. So back in the 90s, so I was told that this, this was the case. So this is not new either. But when I started to doing uh, uncertainty analysis, they were fairly more risk analysis. There was most the risk that was there. So the focus in the analysis was the downside, find the elements that harm the project and get rid of those. And the opportunities was left alone. So in 2010, when I started as a researcher uh, at the time, uh, we did a fairly large case study on 12 uh, Norwegian projects, seven from oil and gas and five from the public industry. 
And the data from those studies showed the same pattern. There were much more risks in the system than opportunities. And in fact, when we came to the execution phase, there were only nine opportunities left in the 12 cases. All the projects that we studied seemed to be quite conservative to take new ideas and change that could actually make the project go better into the system. So the learning was stick to the plan, even when the plan is clearly wrong, <laughs> or the progress report says, if you do so, you will fail miserably. So we teach people like this curve on the left, that this is the smooth path, opportunities, and uh, risks are there, and it will go slowly down, and they will be gone in the end of the project. The study showed that this was clearly not the case. The study showed that the, the risk pattern, that, that went up and down all the time, during the whole project. And the opportunities, they were fading really quickly and was not there when it came to the execution phase. So in 2012, I started starting writing a, a bunch of papers about uh, get, highlighting opportunities and say that they are there and we need to harvest them, we need to exploit them. So one of the papers was called Opportunities in Project. What are they and do we really want them? Uh, and in, in this paper, we made a point out that there are external and internal opportunities there. So these are just examples of what it could be. Uh, and we don't necessarily see them in the beginning of the project. And we do need to harvest them, and we do, no, do need to do something actively to get them into the project, or else they will disappear again. Um, and if we do as planned, plan is the best we can hope for. And if some of the risk actually occurs, we will have a cost or a time of run. So, but we don't necessarily teach our project managers to embrace changes in the project, do we? Harvesting opportunities seen from the project and the project manager's view is often considered as a huge dilemma for them. Thinking of the opportunities that they came up in the upper, upper National Museum for a moment, changing the uh, building from sidecars to prefab. What is the dilemma for the project if they are going to do this? Okay, they have spent years and years of engineering, and they have made plans for sidecars production, and they will lose all that money, and they are ready to start. Should they go for this opportunity? Is it actually an opportunity? Seen from the project manager's view. Because all this work will be lost, and it cost a bunch of money to get on the same page that you were before you actually started to go in and try to harvest this opportunity. So if we are going to have opportunities into the project, we need to spend a lot of money and be willing to spend a lot of money to actually chase them. And that's the dilemma for the project. So that means the new opportunity must be very, very promising to save a lot of money and much, much, much faster than the one thing that we already have in our plans. The project management basically have four possible strategies. They could have low focus on threats and low focus on opportunities. That's kind of the, the left downside corner. Not much project is there if there is a large complex project. Then they can have like low focus on threats and high on opportunities. So I would suggest that is kind of the starting point for very many projects. And then they could have the, in the down corner, high focus on risk and low focus on opportunity. And this is typical of the focus in the execution phase for most of the projects. And then the last corner up here, that's high focus on opportunities and high focus on threats during the whole project. And I will suggest that this is the blind spot for a lot of projects. Very few projects had this in focus in the construction phase. Most of the projects that I have looked into in the last 10 years has reached, as a research, that have a low focus up on opportunities in the execution phase. 
So the new national museum that I have, I have put on up there is one of the few projects where I actually believe they are in that corner. So how have the new national museum worked to get this result? The quality and risk manager from the project, Yvonne Bjerke, she will now present some of the key elements in how the new national museum has changed their uncertainty management process to actively chase opportunities and not just handing risks. Thank you, Ahmed. In Stasbik's project model, we have a continuous uncertainty management process. The process includes planning, handling, monitoring, and evaluating uncertainties. And it ensures that we communicate uncertainty status to both internal and external stakeholders. By developing and implementing this process, we ensure that all the projects in Statsbygs establish and maintain an uncertainty register and matrix. And we have achieved by this process that all the small and medium pro projects in Statsbygd deliver on cost, time, and quality. Over the three, four last years, we now have some larger and more complex projects in our project portfolio. And the new National Museum is absolutely one of those. And in 2015, we discovered that we had only three opportunities left in the project's uncertainty register. And we needed to find out if it was the reason that the uncertainty management process that Stelspeak has, that it didn't fit for large and complex projects. And could we develop this process further? And the most important question, could we get the project back on track by systematically hunt for opportunities? So we had to come up with a new strategy for uncertainty management. As we learned from Agnes' research, most projects identify and focus on opportunities in the planning phase, but not so much in the execution phase. And I had a vision that in addition to the right process and of course top management focus, we needed to have commitment from all the levels of our project organization. And we have a rather big project organization. I have about 50 colleagues in the project organization, and that is in addition to all the contractors, the architect, and the engineering group. So we had to achieve commitment from all the people to make this strategy a success. So we had to come up with some new tools, and we developed five new concepts in the process, in the project. We combined the cost and uncertainty management in the contract management into one process. We have 27 contracts altogether in the project, 25 of them still running when this new strategy took place. So we established one uncertainty register and matrix for each of the contracts in addition to the risk and opportunity register for the whole project. We also introduced opportunity studies, both for the project level and for some of the largest contracts. We introduced internal uncertainty analysis on a quarterly basis, and we improved the annual external uncertainty analysis. And as Angna mentioned, we also introduced uncertainty analysis with focus on time. By implementing these tools, we went from three opportunities in 2015 to 160 in 2018. And the estimated value of these 160 opportunities is $65 million. So this figure shows today's uncertainty management process in the Project New National Museum. We implemented the five new concepts in our plan for uncertainty management. And we established a procedure describing the 
uncertainty management to ensure that all the 25 contract managers did the uncertainty management in the same way and that the uncertainty management were done in a systematic way. We established all the new uncertainty registers and the contract managers report the status of both costs, risks and opportunities on a monthly basis to the project director. And we also added the quarterly internal analysis, the opportunity studies, and the improved process for the external analysis. This slide is some of my colleagues hunting for opportunities in the project. In June 2016, we introduced the first opportunity study as a pilot. 20 participants with uh, all project management levels, from the project director to the contracts managers and their assistants participated. Uh, I facilitated this workshop and during these three hours, 20 new important opportunities were identified. So we took these opportunities into the project's uncertainty registers we worked further on with identifying actions to harvest them, and we had uncertainty owners and set up deadlines for harvesting the opportunities. And this was a success, so now this is done on a quarterly basis, and the opportunity studies have a really high priority in the project. In uh, January this year, we experienced that we had expected cost overrun in some of the largest contracts in the project. So we decided to try out a different way of conducting these opportunity studies. We invited the contractors on the largest contracts to opportunity studies, together with the contract managers in Stadsbygg. And I was a bit excited on how this uh, would work out because we had some conflicts in some of these contracts and how could we force the contractors and the contract managers to be optimistic. Uh, but it turned out that when they were not allowed to think about risks or discuss problems, a lot of very important opportunities came up. And in fact, many of the contractors already had been thinking of these opportunities but we hadn't had a system for them to bring it on to Stadsbygg. So we established opportunity registers that the Stadsbygg's contract manager and the contractor own together. And then they have been having, having follow-up sessions. There they have presented the most important opportunities they have been working with and also the impact on the contract. And of course, we also have communicated this to the other contracts in the project so they can learn from each other because many of the contracts can then have the same opportunities. And as a side effect, these opportunity studies, they have created a positive working environment and an optimistic way of working. This is uh, Christopher, one of my colleagues. He is a contract manager for one of the 25 contracts. And in this picture, he is working with the uncertainty register and matrix in his contract. And this is not a tool that is, uh, he is working with for uh, two hours uh, in the end of the month before he's going to report to the project director. This is used on a daily basis. And if Christopher and all the other contracts manager hadn't seen the value of this tool and hadn't been committed to this process, we had not been able to come up with all these opportunities that we have been identifying in the project. In our uncertainty strategy, we state that we are obligated to have an annual external 
uncertainty analysis. And as a risk manager, I had experienced some frustration in the organization after the processes in 2014 and 2015. A big group of people sat down for eight hours with the external facilitators and they were supposed to come up with the most likely, the most optimistic and pessimistic estimates on all the contracts in the projects and also on all the uncertainty factors. Because of lack of knowledge to this process, they were not committed to the process and there were frustration in the project about this. And I also think that the outcome of the analysis was not realistic because of how the process was conducted. So we decided in November 2016 to try a different method of the external analysis. And since we already had established the contract management where we combined cost and uncertainty management with monthly reporting, we divided the external analysis into several meetings where the external facilitators, project director and contract managers sat down. They presented status, opportunities and risks for the contracts and discussed. And then it were easy for them to come up with a triple estimate on cost for that contract. And when we conducted the process in this way, everyone could participate, everyone were committed, and the outcome of the external uncertainty analysis were more realistic. In 2016, um, we had an estimate of a huge cost overrun of the project's cost. And we decided that we needed to have a more frequently update on the cost on the project. So we used the external uncertainty analysis model and had a quarterly internal process where we updated this model. And when we did this, all the participants, they didn't forget the process between the annual, and the annual analysis and we have an updated cost expectation at all times. And we also improved uh, how we use the results of both the external and internal uncertainty analysis. Now we make sure that we update the project's uncertainty register with these uncertainty factors from the analysis. This figure shows that we were able to identify 11 opportunities in the planning phase in this large project. And in the construction phase so far, we have 160. And new opportuni opportunities are identified every day. And the estimated cost consequence is $65 million. Of course, the exact outcome cannot be established yet because the project is still running. And not all of the opportunities will be harvested and not all of the risks will occur. But I am sure that if we had not made a system and a process for systematically hunting for opportunities, this number of 160 opportunities would be 80% lower. Agnar mentioned the one opportunity in the project that we went from sidecast to prefab. And I would like to show you the example of how we used our new process for uncertainty management regarding this opportunity. The opportunity was identified in the first opportunity study that we had in June 2016, and it was taken into the project's uncertainty register the same month. Consequences related to time was documented in the uncertainty analysis with focus on time in October the same year. And in November, we made a decision that we were going from sidecast to prefab. A lot of re-engineering was necessary. And in November 2017, the prefab was completed. The result of 
identifying and harvesting this opportunity was a cost save of one million dollar. But even more important, we saved three to five months and we were almost back on track on the project's plan. So, are the opportunities worth hunting for? 2016 estimated huge cost overrun. Two years later, we report that we are going to deliver the project on cost, time, and quality. And I am proud to say that hunting for opportunities has been a natural part of running the project. And of course, it's worth hunting also in our total portfolio at Statsbygg. Uh, the portfolio includes three more big projects in addition to the National Museum. It's the Veterinary Life Science Building on the top left. And then it's the new governmental quarters in Oslo on the bottom right and then the building for the life science, uh, sciences for the university in Oslo. And these three, four projects all together add up to 275,000 square meters and 2.5 billion US dollars. So of course, there, there are potential. The keys to success, to take along to make this happen also in the broader portfolio are quite essential, I think. The project team have to have a strong focus on actually using the results from the uncertainty management process, as Yvonne has been through. And it has to be done on a daily basis on estimating and management, managing time and cost. And this broad process really um, takes commitment. Everyone needs to be involved and everyone needs to have ownership to the process and to the results. And then to have the top management involvement that they really participate in workshops, it's crucial. The leadership matters. And I think that the bottom up risk management approach with the top management ownership has uh, also can be regarded as a, an approach uh, on its own to leadership. Because for, for this project, the project director kind of used the uncertainty management process as an essential part of his leadership for the project. And to have an innovative environment, we need to also expand today's toolbox to include, as Yvonne has been through, plans and procedures for the uncertainty management, to do also uncertainty management for every and each contract, to do opportunity studies, and to more frequently have internal uncertainty analysis. It has proved to be successful for this project, and I'm certain it will prove to be um, successful also for other projects in our portfolio. You have already now learned about this painting, the scream. And in this painting, you can see Espen Askelad. It will also be on display in the museum. And Espen Askelad, he represents the essence of a Norwegian hunting for opportunities. And uh, I think that this little boy, he is uh, dreaming and imagining about something really positive and brilliant in the distance. It's the Surya Moria castle. And um, in the shaping 
and the building of the National Museum, I think we have had some inspiration from him. And hopefully this story that we now have told you about hunting for opportunities will inspire also you to, to do the same hunt. And I strongly believe that for us as leader, leaders, we need to be curious about it and we need to be involved and we need to give space for bottom-up initiatives and commit. And I'm also certain that we need to have some sort of imagination in order to take it out in a broader part of a project portfolio. Thank you very much. Okay, great job, thank you. We, um, we only have time for one question. We did get a lot of questions, but we have a group right behind you, so I'm gonna ask the one question, and um, a lot of discussion around opportunity in your presentation. So the question is, do you have recommendations regarding how to set an economic or time hurdle for electing to pursue an opportunity? You know, that is, uh, when do you decide it's not worth it from a time or economic perspective? How do you gauge that? Uh, I think like for me as a, as a project owner, I will always ask for uh, consistent uh, information and data about, okay, what will the gains be and what, what, how much time will it take us and to, to estimate both the time and cost consequences. Sure. So, but I, know, I don't know, Yvonne, maybe you can also add something to that uh, question. Yes, well, we always uh, have this evaluation if it, what its uh, estimated cost and the estimated uh, impact on the project, both on time and cost. So this is a continuous evaluation of all the opportunities and also risks that we identify. Yeah, and you actually had quite a few uh, positive comments about the fact that you, you know, talked about quality as a metric versus just cost and schedule. So that was very, uh, a positive theme that came from the, the questions that, you know, that's certainly a factor, yes sir. Bottom line is that uh, you don't really know before it helps. You have, you have to let these flowers grow a little bit before you actually know if they are better. It's, it's really easy to kill opportunities. Most of us do it every day. Sure. So, um, so we need to kind of let them grow. Blossom a little bit, right. Yeah, right. before we actually start killing them. Right, making a decision as to whether it's a go or a no-go. Okay. Very good, again, uh, I apologize. I know there's a lot of questions, so again, we've got the VIP booth as an opportunity. Uh, uh, during the lunch hour, we've got kind of an extended lunch this, uh, this uh, today, so there's a good opportunity to uh, circle back with this team and get a chance to ask the questions that we didn't get to during this session. So I thank you for your participation today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.